From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here, Johnny. Uh-oh, what fantastic character is Floyd's of England insured this time? Now, what is that supposed to mean? More singing mice, wayward cats, and how about the counterfeit money problem? Johnny... No, no, let me guess. John, if you'll just listen to I me... got it. You're in trouble because you've done a switch. You've insured somebody against living instead of the other way around, that it? Of course not. No, I must admit we do have one policy of that sort in effect. There, I knew it. However, that is not the one I called you about. Okay, George, what is? We've issued a policy. Well, I guess it is a little unusual at that. I fear the worst, but go on. Well, it's on a small brewery over near... Brewery? You mean a beer factory? That's right. It's over near the town of Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, I know that country pretty well. Good. We've insured the Dortmund Brewery against possible damage from a nearby construction project. Well, you said unusual. What's so unusual about that? Uh... Perhaps you'd better come over here and let me tell you. Yeah. When you say it that way, I guess I'd better. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the JPD matter. Expense account item one, $1.10, taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office, where he promptly dragged me over to a large map tacked to one of the walls. Here it is, Johnny, between the towns of Tamaqua and Frackville, Pennsylvania, on a little river that's called uh, Pinksatawney Creek. Old Indian name, I believe. Uh Uh-huh. The Dortmund Brewery is just about here. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll rent a car in New York and drive over there. Now, wait. By making a couple of train changes, you can get most of the way over there by rail. Anything to save the company a buck, is that it? Why not? When that freewheeling expense account of yours gets into operation... Okay, okay. What's the face value of the policy? Coverage for the whole plant, $820,000. Wow-wee. So I'll rent a car in New York. All right, all right. Now, as I told you, we've insured the Dortmund Brewery against possible damage from the building of a plant right next to it. What kind of a plant? Competition. Another brewery. Oh, I see. Possible malicious damage. Is that what they're thinking of? Well, that's what J.P. seems to be worried about. J.P.? J.P. Dortman. Owner, manager, president, brewmeister, and anything else you can think of. Has anything happened yet? No, but I want you to go there and be sure that nothing does. Is this J.P. my contact? Yes. Okay, George, I'm on my way. <laughs> Expense account item two, nine thirty-five, fare and incidentals, Hartford to New York. Item three, fifty dollars, deposit on a drive your own car. Item four, fifty cents, toll through the Holland Tunnel. I cut straight across the top of Jersey, crossed the Delaware at Phillipsburg, and finally pulled into the little town of Tamaqua shortly after six p.m. Items five, six, and seven, twelve twenty. For dinner, a place to rest my weary head, and breakfast the next morning. The Dortmund Brewery sat on the western bank of Pinksatawney Creek, about five miles out of town, and looked as though it had been sitting there for a thousand years. It was a small affair, and the old frame buildings were badly in need of a coat of paint. Just north of it rose a towering cliff, and on top of that cliff stood an array of cranes and machines and bulldozers that are used on modern large-scale construction jobs. I parked my car at the entrance of the office building and was greeted at the door by a large, raw-boned woman of about 50 with straggly yellow hair and wearing a faded blue cotton dress that looked as though it hadn't been ironed in years. Something I can do for you? Oh, why, uh, I'm looking for Mr. J.P. Dorton. Mister? That's a laugh. Is it? Why? Because I'm J.P. What? That's right. Anything wrong with it? Well, I... Hey, uh... wait a minute. You and another of those lawyers from that job up on the cliff come to fancy talk me about no. not having to worry in the world about what they're doing to no, me up there. No, no. And how I... I'd better mind my own business. What do you mean, no? My name is Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm here on behalf of Floyd's of England. The insurance company? Well, now, that's different. You come on into my private office, Johnny. 
Her private office was furnished with a battered walnut desk, some ancient filing cabinets, and a couple of straight wooden chairs. Nothing else. Hardly the kind of an office you'd expect for the president of a company worth $820,000. There's nothing fancy about it, Johnny, because there's nothing fancy about any part of my brewery. But that isn't what counts. We've been here ever since my great-great-grandfather built it up. And all we've cared about is making the finest beer in the country. Gretchen? And we do make it, too. Gretchen, can't you hear me out? Yes, J.P.? Gretchen, I want you to bring Mr. Dollar a pitcher full and a glass. Yes, ma'am. Well, look, I'm afraid I'm not much of a beer You man, will but... be when you've tasted this. It's the creek that does it, you know, Pinksatawney Creek. Finest water for beer in the whole United States. That's what makes good beer, you know. Yes, so I've heard. That's why that dirty Clarkson Kemper bunch are building up on the cliff to get at that water. I understand they'll be your competitors. Ha! All their fancy modern equipment and methods can't produce the brew the way I can. The long, slow, easy way. With all the good old-fashioned apparatus. The old country methods. Yes, I see. Why, Johnny, we make our own barley malt. And we grind it by hand. And we come up with a wort that's second to none in the world. The old-type sparger, too. And the hop jacks. And the finest strain of yeast there is. Yes, I'm sure that Three full months we age before we rack a drop. Sure, we take more time and more trouble. But we come up with a better brew. Better than any modern plant can ever make. Well, then what's your problem? They're getting ready to blast up on that cliff. Blast? A whole big chunk of it away. And when they do, that whole thing will come crashing down here. Thousands of tons of rock. Well, surely there's some state authority or something to prevent that. Oh, they bamboozled the authorities. And your insurance company, too. They'll say it was an accident. A miscalculation. And when that rock comes crashing down here, it'll wreck this whole plant of mine. Well, you do have insurance, remember? It'll wreck all my fine old equipment that can never again be replaced because there are no such things anymore. Well, when's all this blasting supposed to take place? Who knows? Tonight, tomorrow, next week. Who knows? That soon? Yeah. So, Johnny, if there's anything you can do, you'd better do it now. What's insurance money if I have to lose this for it? Who knows? Maybe she was right suspecting her rivals might try a stunt like that to put her out of business. But it all seemed a little too far-fetched. And yet, when I think of some of the unscrupulous things that have been done to put down competition, maybe she was justified in suspecting this Carlson Kemper crowd of... Yeah, maybe she was. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Massachusetts state flag, bearing a green pine tree, is the descendant of the famous Liberty Tree flag that came out of Boston to serve all the original 13 colonies. It was under the Liberty Tree flag that the Sons of Liberty met and planned the Boston Tea Party, that our floating batteries on the Delaware River defended Philadelphia, and on the Charles River defied Howe's cannons. Beneath the tree is inscribed the state motto, En petit placidum sub libertate quietum. By the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. These words were originally written by the famous English patriot Algernon Sidney about 1659. This was a message intended for King George III. Unhappily, it went unheeded. Massachusetts state flag, the flag of the sixth state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 18th, 1904. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the J.P.D. Matter. If J.P. Dorfman was right, if there was the least possibility she was right in her suspicion that Carlson Kemper would blast thousands of tons of rock down on a little plant in order to put her out of business, well, there was only one thing to do. I got back into my car and drove by a roundabout way up to the top of the cliff overlooking the Dorfman Brewery. There in the middle of the vast array of heavy construction equipment, giant cranes, trucks, huge cement mixers, and so on, I found the main construction shack. And by a stroke of luck, one of the partners in the proposed new brewery, Mr. James Carlson. (laughs) Ah, that crazy old lady's being absurd, Mr. Dollar. (laughs) If you really want the truth, I think she'd welcome our smashing that antiquated brewery of hers out of existence. Is that what you plan to do, Mr. Carlson? Can you be serious? By blasting a few tons of rock off the face of the cliff into the river? Or a few thousand tons? Or a few thousand tons. Won't do that place of hers a bit of harm. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. 
Only thing I'm not sure of is why she stays in business. What do you mean by that? Well, she can't be making any money. Methods she uses were out of date in this country 50 years ago. The product's good, sure. But today, you've got Snowball. Did you know, Dollar, that out of the goodness of my heart, I offer to take that crummy plant of hers off her hands? Or because her location is better, down next to the water supply. Oh, partly, sure. I offered her nearly half a million for her spot. To 400,000, to be exact. But no dice. She just kept bothering us, trying to get out a lot of injunctions against our building there. I assume you have the necessary permits for this blasting operation. <laughs> Whole draw for them. Hey, look at them yourself. At the same time, appreciate the volume of red tape necessary to do anything these days. But suppose that something should go wrong. That quite by accident, the top of that cliff should drop down on J.P.'s brewery. Mr. Dollar, it's to obviate any such possibility that I called in one of the foremost blasters in the country, who uh, purely incidentally is top man for one of the biggest makers of explosives in the world. You talk to him, Mr. Dollar. Maybe I will. Believe me, I can understand why you might not take my word for the safety of the operation we're about to undertake, but certainly you can't question his word. You say about to undertake. When? I believe he's planned the big blow-off for tonight. Tonight? Yeah, come on. I'll take you to it. We found this expert, a Mr. Sidney Crutchfield, in a small, tidy shack set out near the edge of the cliff, working over a series of complicated diagrams with a busy slide rule in his hand. And I must confess, he turned out to be one of the most interesting men I've ever met. Tall, slim, and gray-haired, he had a quiet, easy, yet confident manner that completely belied his hazardous occupation. This was the man who had done the dynamiting for some of the biggest jobs in this country, had moved mountains and rivers in the construction of huge dams, had blasted the way for some of our vast highway networks. As you can see by the dates on these sheets, I finished planning this blast over two weeks ago. But I find that constant checking and rechecking never does any harm. Mr. Carlson tells me you plan to set off this blast tonight. Yes. Actually, I shall push the plunger at exactly 2 o'clock tomorrow morning. If Mr. Carlson is ready. Don't you worry about it, Mr. Crutchfield. We're moving the equipment and the shacks away right now. Excellent. And at the time of the blast, no one is to be here but me. That's what your contract says. And that's the way it must be. For safety, Mr. Crutchfield? <laughs> well call it a fetish of mine. Uh-huh. And there'll be no damage to the brewery plant down below? I'll stake my reputation on it. Come, Mr. Dollar. If you like, I'll show you how I've made the sets for this blast. We spent the rest of the day inspecting every tunnel, shaft, and drill hole into which the explosives have been packed and fused. And the artistry of this man was evident from the word go. By 6 p.m., all the machines and shacks and equipment had been moved back from the edge of the cliff that was to be blown off. The place was deserted, except for Mr. Crutchfield and me. And now, you must get into your car and leave, Mr. Dollar. But if there's no danger... Please. I prefer it this way. Surely you're not still concerned about the blast? <sighs> to be honest about it, no. Not one bit. And I wasn't at the moment. Yeah, this amazing man simply couldn't do anything wrong. I would have staked my life on it. But by the time I'd driven the long, curving road to the Dortmund Brewery below, had found the place not only deserted, but completely shut down, a funny little hunch began to grow in the back of my head. Even the office building was dark, as far as I could see. With the help of a business card, I slipped the lock on the front door. And then I saw the thin streak of light under the door of J.P.'s private office. I thought I heard something in there. The office was a shambles. Account books and papers scattered all over the place. A couple of cartons, the drawers of the crusty old files were open and for the most part empty. Somebody had been hastily packing and removing all the important papers. But why? I'm sorry, Johnny. Oh, uh... Sorry! Oh! And you seemed like such a nice boy. Come on! Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Anyone who has survived the rigors of basic training is familiar with a great variety of milk that is dished out periodically in the armed forces. Now, there's frozen milk, concentrated milk, frozen concentrate, and good old powdered milk. But sometimes... 
Supplying wholesome, fresh, real milk has been a problem when servicemen have been stationed in out-of-the-way places. The United States Air Force came across that problem some time ago in the island of Teixeira, in the Azores, those Portuguese islands that dot an eastern portion of the Atlantic Ocean. The air base there was considered powdered milk country for a long time. Although cattle have played an important role in the economy of the island of Teixeira, the herd was badly inbred and milk production was very low. Modern milk processing was not a part of the picture. And with the help of Portuguese veterinarians, the men in the United States Air Force unit worked out a free breeding service by using a small herd of milk cows acquired in England and the cattle there at Teixeira improved. Then a complete pasteurizing, homogenizing, sterilizing, bottling refrigeration plant was flown in from the United States. As soon as this activity got underway, milk production began to climb steadily, and thirsty Air Force men and civilians were soon buying and drinking the new fresh milk. When economy of the island began to rise rapidly, the people were happy and grateful. You might say that a little milk of human kindness increased understanding on an island of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the J.P.D. Matter. When I came to in the office of the Dortmund Brewery, my head fell as though it had been split wide open. The sash weight had been used on it lay beside me. But why had J.P. struck me down from behind the door where she'd been waiting for me? And why before that had she been hastily packing a lot of business papers, bills and so on, to take away? A couple of them still lay under me where I'd fallen. It was several minutes before I found strength enough to roll over and try to push myself to my feet. As I did so, two things. I saw two things. One was a bill she'd overlooked in her haste to get away. A bill from Frank Line Powder Company addressed to her personally. A bill for 21 cases of dynamite and some other explosives. The other was my watch. I'd been out for hours, too many hours. For according to my watch, it was 1.52 a.m., Exactly eight minutes before the tremendous dynamite blast on the cliff above was to be set off. And suddenly I knew where, somehow, by her plan, those thousands of tons of rock would land. And not harmlessly in the river below. And I knew why J.P. had left me here. So I'd be crushed by them. Oh. 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 Come on, come on, come on. Oh, please, please, come on. Hello, hello. Oh, please, hello, hello. Operator. Operator, this is emergency. Yes, sir. Hey, look, now, I'm, I'm calling from Dortmund Brewery. It's between... Yes, I know where it is, sir. There's a big construction. Carlson Kemper, that's the name. Well, sir, Up on the I... cliff above this, this sir, brewery here. Sir, sorry, but those lines were disconnected late this afternoon. What? But look, surely there's some way to... Operator... I'm sorry, sir, but there's no way to ring them. Oh, no. Oh, I've got to, I've got to get out. I've just got to get out of here. Somehow I've got to get out there and get it. Oh, no. I'm... Oh, please. i got to... i got to get in there. Can I get in Don't push like... that plunger. I'm sorry, Don't set Mr. off Dollar. that flash. That's no. That's exactly what I'm going to do right now. No, you're not. No, no. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. You have no right to interfere. You now stand hear back. hear what I said. Dollar, put down that gun. You touched that plunger and so help me. I'll pull this trigger. Now wait a minute. Dollar, 
Stellar, what's the matter with you? Oh, I... What's happened to you, man? Oh, good heavens, man. I guess it was just luck that I was still hanging on to that bill for the dynamite that I'd found. I guess it was luck that made Crutchfield grab it when he tried to keep me from falling. Made him look at it carefully by the light of his flashlight. But it was his good sense that kept him from going ahead and setting off that charge. When daylight came, he found the spot on the face of the cliff where J.P. had another charge planted. It was set to go off by concussion from the blast that Crutchfield had set. It would have diverted the rock from Crutchfield's blast to smack dab on top of her little beer factory. Nobody would ever have known who'd really done it. And J.P. would have collected 820000 insurance for it. Incidentally, when the police caught up with her, which wasn't hard, they also found the book she'd taken from her office. Yeah, J.P. Dortman was broke. Stony. Expense account total, including a handful of doctor bills for my aching head, and all the incidentals I could think of, $204.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star, there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. The origin of Hawaii state flag has been the subject of much debate. It is now believed that it was the work of foreign advisors to King Kamehameha. Legend also has it that it was designed at the request of King Kamehameha by George Beckley, an English sea captain. The flag consists of eight horizontal and alternating stripes of white, red, and blue, representing the eight major islands in the chain. Also represented is the British Union Jack, a reminder of Captain Vancouver, who on his voyage around the world in 1794 gave King Kamehameha a British flag and the promise of British protection. The Union Jack is also a reminder of Captain James Cook, who discovered the Hawaiian Islands in 1778. Hawaii state flag, the flag of the 50th state to enter the Union, was adopted in 1845. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the ideal vacation matter. But believe me, it turns out to be neither ideal nor a vacation. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Eleanor Audley, Gene Bates, G. Stanley Jones, Alan Reed, and Austin Green. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. You've been listening to the OTR Gold Network. Find more classic radio at otrgold.com.